Hello everyone, I'm Martin Swetman, and in this video I'm going to take a look at the latest research on Abu Huraira and relate it to the decoding of Gebekli Tepe and the origin of civilization. Now you might have seen newspaper articles about this research in the last few days. Uh, one of the world's first settlements, Abu Huraira in northern Syria, was destroyed by a cometary airburst. Um, one of many that occurred on one of the worst days in history, the Younger Dryas catastrophe about 12,850 years ago. Now the destruction of Abu Huraira has been a contentious issue in the research literature. Uh, the Comet Research Group who lead the research into this issue have long claimed it was destroyed by a cometary airburst and provided excellent evidence to back this up. And the new paper they've just published is their latest effort in this regard. Their opponents, on the other hand, have claimed Abu Huraira was destroyed by a simple house fire and has got nothing to do with any cosmic catastrophe. Well, this new paper puts that issue to rest. The authors focus on melt glass found in the burned layer at Abu Huraira, which is thought to be an extension of the Younger Dryas black mat into the Near East. Now, this melt glass, which I'll just find for you, here are some pictures. Now this melt glass must itself have formed at a high temperature uh, over a thousand degrees Celsius, but the Comet Research Group in this paper go a step further and carefully analyze uh, mineral grains like chromite uh, stuck onto the surface or inside these grains of melt glass uh, they, and they use advanced kinds of microscopy and chemical analysis. And what they find is that there are some grains, like chromite for instance, that show clear evidence not just of melting but also of boiling. And this is revealed by the bubbly texture of these grains and how they have melted and diffused into the surrounding melt glass medium. Now if you look at this table further on in their paper, it indicates that temperatures in excess of 2600 degrees Celsius must have occurred to do this uh, in order to boil chromite grains. Now this is an extreme temperature. Uh, you have to go to hundreds of miles down into Earth's interior to find these kinds of temperatures. So they are far beyond what can be created by volcanism, for example. And as there is no obvious crater near Abu Huraira, the only reasonable explanation for these temperatures is a cosmic airburst. Uh, caused by a, a comet fragment, for example. Lightning is ruled out um, by analysing remnant or trapped magnetism in these grains. And of course these temperatures are way too hot to have been caused by any kind of normal wildfire or house fire. And the authors also show that the same kinds of melted minerals have been produced by known atomic explosions and by other crater-forming asteroid impacts. So it's absolutely clear, although there was no real doubt about this anyway, even before this paper was published, that Abu Huraira was one of the victims on this incredible day that wiped out many species of large animal or megafauna, uh, destroyed several ancient cultures across the world, and triggered the Younger Dryas mini ice age that lasted over a thousand years. And you can see my review of the entire research literature on this issue, at least up to 2015 so far, if you want to know more about this uh, through my prehistory decoded channel on here on YouTube. So what is this event uh, and the destruction of Abu Huraira? What has it got to do with Gebekli Tepe and the origin of civilization? Well, let's just review who was living at Abu Huraira. Um, the, the people living in this region were known as, or are known as early Natufians. Their culture created the world's first known permanent settlements in the Fertile Crescent, which is in the, the Near East. So they are credited with beginning the civilizing process of settling down to make permanent houses. And they could do this because they are known to have stored food. So they are one step ahead of the typical hunter-gatherer of the time who roamed the land seeking food and shelter on a daily or at least seasonal basis. These people instead, the Natufians, stayed in one place throughout the year 
and stored food through the winter. They are therefore more accurately called hunter-collectors and not hunter-gatherers. Now it's also thought that at another early Natufian site, uh, Tel Caramel, which is not so far from Abu Huraira, that these people built the world's first stone towers. And probably they were the most advanced people the world had ever seen to that point. Nevertheless, their communities were still quite small, perhaps just one to two hundred people, and there, are, there is not yet any indication of the specialisms or social hierarchies that herald the arrival of civilization. So these people, the most advanced in the world so far, as far as we know, were making the way in an age just prior to the onset of civilization. But then they were suddenly destroyed by the Younger Dryas catastrophe, along with many other cultures and creatures across the world. The people that live after them in this region of the Fertile Crescent in the Near East are known as the Late Natufian, and uh, the archaeological evidence suggests there were fewer of these people, the Late Natufians, and that they returned to a more nomadic way of life after this Younger Dryas impact event. Except, that is, at Gebekli Tepe. Also known as the world's first temple, Gebekli Tepe truly is the world's first ancient wonder, as it clearly heralds the arrival of civilization. And that's because at Gebekli Tepe we have these amazing stone circles formed of giant pillars covered with symbols, rather like a bunch of stone hinges, except more advanced. And the people who constructed this site clearly had learned some specialisms like stone masonry and were sufficiently well organized to be able to to build the place. Moreover, Gebekli Tepe is only a few dozen miles from where the earliest signs of domesticated plants and animals in the world are found several hundred, uh, several thousand years later. Therefore, Gebekli Tepe is generally recognized as playing a crucial role in the origin of civilization. Now, very interestingly, Gebekli Tepe is only about 100 miles north of Abu Huraira. There is no doubt, therefore, that the people living in the region of Gebekli Tepe would also have witnessed the terrible disaster of the Younger Dryas impact, 10,850 BC, more or less. The explosion over Abu Huraira would have been visible or even heard for hundreds of miles around. Indeed, the blast might even extended as far as the region of Gebekli Tepe. It all depends on the size of the comet fragment that exploded. Now along with Demetrius Tsikritsis, I published a peer-reviewed paper in 2017 that decoded the animal symbols on the broad sides of the pillars at Gebekli Tepe. And remarkably, it turns out that they almost certainly represent constellations, practically the same constellations we use today in the West. And we know this because the statistical case supporting this theory is so extremely strong. Now the other amazing thing about these symbols is that Gebekli Tepe appears to memorialize this catastrophic event, the Younger Dryas impact event. Indeed, Pillar 43 at Gebekli Tepe seems to record the date of this disaster. So how do we know this? Well, this is what we said back in 2017 in our Fox paper. First, it should be recognized that the construction of Gebekli Tepe is an amazing feat of willpower for its time. It is quite literally many thousands of years ahead of its time. The people who built it must have been possessed by an amazing new idea, which, given the site is probably a kind of temple, suggests the birth of a new religion. Certainly, religious fanaticism could explain the anomalous existence of Gebekli Tepe at this time. Now, Pillar 43 is the most ornate, which I'm showing here, is the most ornate pillar yet discovered at Gebekli Tepe. So it is clearly saying something important about their new religion and way of life. And here I have a drawing of it. And because of the headless man at the bottom of the pillar, that something probably concerns death. Now, of course, the concept of death could indicate lots of different events, but here on this pillar, the death being referenced is given a date by all of these animal symbols. And remarkably, that date is perfectly in accord with the best dating evidence we have for the Younger Dryas catastrophe. So here's how this dating works. We know the animal symbols on this pillar almost certainly represent the constellations we use today, only some of the symbols are different. 
So the eagle vulture, for example, represents Sagittarius, or at least the teapot asterism or teapot part of Sagittarius. The scorpion represents Scorpius, as it does today. The duck goose at the bottom here represents Libra. This bending bird with fish probably represents Ophiuchus, or at least something like it. And this dog or wolf down here represents lupus, as it does today. And as you can see, if you compare this part of the pillar with the constellations in the sky, the positions of these animals line up very well. So we have Sagittarius, Scorpius, Libra, Lupus and Ophiuchus. They line up very well apart from perhaps Ophiuchus which is a little bit out. Now the circle here which appears right in the middle of the pillar is therefore the, the focus of what the pillar is all about represents the sun on the summer solstice according to our theory. We know it's the summer solstice and not the winter solstice or the equinoxes because we see similar notation at other sites, including nearby Chattel Hoyuk. The circle seems to consistently represent the sun on the summer solstice at these sites. And by the way, these three other animals, therefore, at the top of the pillar, from left to right in order, represent the autumn equinox, the winter solstice and the spring equinox, uh, respectively. And these so-called handbag symbols, therefore, are probably representing the sun on the horizon. Basically, they're representing a sunset. Now, back in 2017, in our Fox paper, we estimated a date from this pillar using the position of the sun, i.e. the circle, relative to Sagittarius, which is the eagle vulture, on the summer solstice. We said that if we assume that the eagle vulture represents the teapot part, as shown here, of the constellation Sagittarius. And if we take a position midway between the lid here and the wing here, we get a date using Stellarium, which is where this image is taken from, of around about 10,950 BC to within about 250 years. In other words, 250 years earlier or later than this date, the sun would not have appeared in this region uh, next to Sagittarius. However, we can now provide an even more accurate date by using more of the information on this pillar. So how can we do this? Well, let's assume these people were good astronomers and, and knew what they were doing. And also let's assume the animal symbols represent exactly the same constellations in all their details that we use today as shown in Stellarium. And many people would balk at that, making that, that latter association. But so far, this assumption has served us very well in decoding these animal symbols in all the many places they are found. Now, first, it is clear, according to this picture, that the sun is much closer to the wing than it is to the head of the eagle vulture. And remember, I said if it was halfway between, we got a date of 10,950 BC. So by placing the sun much closer to the wing, this is probably telling us an upper limit of around 10,900 BC for this date, because the sun on the summer solstice moves in this direction with increasing date. So the date of this event, whatever it was, was probably later than 10,900 BC. But we can do better than that by looking at the other solstices and equinoxes. Remember I said that the leftmost animal, the bending bird without the fish, represented the autumn equinox, which is in the constellation Pisces at the time. And that the rightmost symbol, the splayed bear, represents the spring equinox, which was in the constellation Virgo at the time. However, the middle symbol represents the winter solstice. And importantly, at the time of the Younger Dras catastrophe, the winter solstice constellation was in the process of changing from Gemini, representing, represented by the ibex, the charging ibex as shown here, to Taurus, uh, which according to our ancient zodiac is, re is represented by the rhino, not the bull as it is today. Now here I have a snapshot of the position of the sun at 10,800 BC. And as you can see, it is almost exactly halfway between the constellations of Gemini and Taurus. 
Now we don't know how these people define the transition point between Gemini and Taurus, but it is clear that by 750 BC, the winter solstice sun will have moved much closer to Taurus than to Gemini. So from this, we can say that 10,750 BC is a lower limit for the date represented on the pillar, because then the symbol for Taurus would have been presented rather than the symbol for Gemini. Therefore, putting both pieces of information together, we can say that the date written on the pillar is likely to be somewhere between 10,900 and 10,750 BC. Now, what is the date of the Younger Dryas impact that destroyed Abu Huraira? The best estimate for the date of this event is given in a paper by the Comet Research Group from 2015. Here it is. And they give a date range of uh, 12,835 to 12,735 BP. Now BP means before 1950 AD. So this actually translates exactly to 10,885 to 10,785 BC. So let's just compare that date range with the one written on the pillar, uh, pillar 43 at Quebec Tepe. And as you can see, they are almost exactly the same. It's very likely then that this pillar memorializes the Younger Dryas impact event, an event which we can expect was sufficiently extreme to have provided the motivation for a new religion and construction of the world's first wonder, Gebekli Tepe. Now, if you read our 2017 Fox paper, you'll see that there is other evidence at Gebekli Tepe that corroborates this suggestion. First, we have Pillar 2, as shown here, which likely tracks the path in the sky of the radiant of the Torrid meteor stream at the time Gebekli Tepe was occupied. And it's the Torrid meteor stream which is thought to have been responsible for the Younger Dryas impact. So the path of the Torrid meteor radiant goes from Capricornus through Aquarius to Pisces at the time, which in our ancient zodiac are represented by the bull, the fox, and the bending bird. And you can see there is a good correlation in these symbols and constellations. And pillar 18, uh, the largest pillar yet found at Quebec Tepe seems to be saying that it was specifically the fox, in other words Aquarius, that caused the disaster, again indicating the Torrid meteor stream at the height of its intensity at the time. And there are other symbolic indications of comets too, but see our fox paper for those. So in the end, what have we got? We have the world's first ancient wonder, a temple on a hilltop at the centre of the Fertile Crescent where agriculture appears first in the world. A temple that is implicated in the origin of civilization. And very likely this temple is dedicated to the Younger Dryas event, which destroyed Abu Huraira 100 miles to the south. Clearly our conclusion from this should be that civilization probably began with a bang. Specifically, the Younger Dryas event seems to have inspired a new religion or a comet cult that eventually led the surviving Natufian people to build Gebekli Tepe. In turn, this new sense of community engendered by this religion, a reaction to this awful disaster, seems to have led directly to the origin of civilization, along with agriculture and the so-called Neolithic Revolution in the millennia that followed. Okay, if you like that, then you might also like my book, Prehistory Decoded, and also see my blog for the latest discoveries, martinsweatman.blogspot.com.